everyone. I ask you to take your seats. We begin this evening by acknowledging that our campus at King's University College is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, and Attawabdurong peoples, all of whom have long-standing relationships to the land of southwestern Ontario and the city of London. The First Nations communities of our local area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, Muncie Delaware Nations. And in our region, there are 11 First Nations communities, as well as a growing indigenous urban population. King's University values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island, also known as North America. So it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening. My name is Jim Pancho. I am a pastoral counselor and part of the campus ministry team here at King's College. It's also my uh, pleasure to coordinate the Veritas Lecture Series. Part of this series is that we really want to endeavor to foster learning and dialogue by gathering our community together and the larger community together as we seek to live lives of faith and justice. Now, tonight's lecture is sponsored by the Ecumenical Commission of the Diocese of London. And uh, although these lectures are offered free of charge, and we're happy to do that uh, due to the generous sponsorship of our partners, I'd like to just draw your attention, if you missed it on the way into our donation box, um, I didn't check to see if it was there. Is the donation box there? Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> so our donation box is, is uh, in support of refugee um, initiatives that we are undertaking here at King's and uh, always uh, happy to have the support through that. So if you missed it on the way in, uh, have a look on the way out. So we continue our, our series this year on the theme of building bridges over walls. And we're pleased to welcome Archbishop Donald Bolin who is here from the Archdiocese of Regina, Saskatchewan. Bishop Bolin did write the book, or at least edited the book, on uh, ecumenical dialogue. And I have it here. Anyway, I'll show it to you later. If you want to have a look, it's a wonderful work on, uh, on unity. As a member of the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity, co-chair of the International Anglican Roman Catholic Commission for Unity and Mission, and co-chair of the Joint International Commission for Dialogue between the World Methodist Council and the Catholic Church, Archbishop Bolin is a wealth and brings a wealth of experience to share with us this evening. So we are grateful for the opportunity to welcome him and to have him join us to present Conversations Over the Fence, Creative initi Initiatives in Ecumenical and Interfaith Relations. Please join me in welcoming Archbishop Donald Bolin. Thank you very much. It's a great joy to be uh, here with you this evening. So thank you to the organizing team for the uh, invitation to take part in this lecture series. Uh, the overall theme, uh, building bridges over walls, is perhaps even more timely than when the organizers came up with the topic. Uh, so uh, your your college, uh, no, I'm gonna get this. Yeah. Your college motto, uh, Christ the way, the truth, and the life, is not only uh, a faith proclamation, but it's, uh, it's an invitation uh, in Christ's name and empowered by his spirit to enter into dialogue with the world. Uh, theme bridges over walls challenges us to that this is your your blurb here challenges us to find new ways of overcoming obstacles and living the gospel of bringing about healing in Christ's body and to foster the church's witness in the wider community I think it's clear to all of us that Christ's body needs healing and that the church's witness to the wider community needs help and deserves our attention. In the incarnation, Christ plunges into the human experience and invites us to do the same. In choosing a topic for my presentation this evening in dialogue with Deacon Jim, 
We chose a theme which covers a lot of territory. It's not a specific academic exploration, uh, but it's more about a way in which the church is called to be a church engaged in the world around us. It's intended, I think, to be a summons to be a church that creatively is ready to embark in a whole range of conversations with others as a way of faithfully living as disciples of Christ. So instead of a, a rigorous, systematic paper on one of the dialogues that I have the privilege of serving, this evening is going to be something of a, an exploration of possibilities around ecumenical and interfaith dialogues or encounters. It's going to be an encouragement to express your faithfulness creatively. It's going to be a summons to increasingly take up the risk uh, and the adventure of dialogue with other Christian communities and with other faith communities and other peoples, those in a special way who are marginalized or victims in a systemic way of injustice. This Veritas series for faith and culture, uh, I read on the website, endeavors to foster learning and dialogue by gathering our community together as we seek to live lives of faith and of justice. So it draws a relationship between uh, dialogue and truth, and it draws a relationship between dialogue and the work of justice. So I hope that will ponder those relationships and what it means to build bridges over walls in the context of ecumenical and interfaith relations. I thought the series had something of a poetic title, and it reminded me of uh, one of the first poems I ever learned, uh, which is perhaps a poem that you learned early in life as well, which is Robert Frost's uh, Mending Wall. Uh, so, I thought we'd start by looking at a few verses of this uh, to, to set the tone about walls and bridges. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill and on a day we met to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We kept the wall between us as we go to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves and some are nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine and I'm apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones of his pines. I tell him, he only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd like to know what I was walling in and walling out and to whom I was likely to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I think this series is about efforts to engage in conversations rather than to build walls. Something there is that doesn't love a wall inspired this series, I think, and hopefully also this evening's presentation. First part of the presentation is on dialogue as constitutive of the church. I went to uh, Google Images and uh, found a few images that came up when I typed in over the, over the fence. <laughs> and uh, when we engage in dialogue over the fence, uh, there are risks. It's a little dangerous. <laughs> we might get <laughs> tossed. But the basic metaphor 
of over the fence suggests meaningful communication. And meaningful communication not on the level of universal churches and commissions and structures, but in our daily lives, in our quotidian world. Pope Francis, early on in his pontificate, noted, when leaders in various fields ask me for advice, my response is always the same. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. This was the inspiration for a document that the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops put out uh, three, three and a half years ago now called A Church in Dialogue. There are actually a series of documents then that came out with that name, but the one that I had the privilege of working on, which is a long one, 24 pages, it was A Church in Dialogue Toward the Restoration of Unity Among Christians. It was time to be put out for the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council's decree on ecumenism. From Popes Paul VI to Pope Francis, each pope in succession has called the people of God to be a church in dialogue with other Christian communities, uh, with world religions, with the culture and the world in which we live. A number of the pontifical councils in Rome, the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, for Interreligious Dialogue, for Culture, all basically have the task of engaging in dialogue on behalf of the church. And they're all trying to foster local dialogue as well. In Canada too, over the past 50 years, we've become a church engaged in dialogue for the promotion of justice, of peace, for the common good, in evangelization, in relationship with other Christian communities and other world religions. Our document made a statement which I think could not have been made prior to the Council. The dialogue has become constitutive of how we as Catholics live our faithfulness to God in the contemporary world. The document was clear to say that all of these dialogues are grounded in an understanding of who God is and that God has entered into a relationship with us human beings, entered into a dialogue with us. Uh, we are created in the image and likeness of God. And while we can ponder exactly what that means, one of the things it means, surely, is that we are created in such a way that we can be in dialogue with God and that God addresses us. God addresses us in dialogue through the human condition and through all of our experience. And God addresses us in dialogue uh, through the prophets, through history, and above all, in the fullness of revelation, through Christ. So the document noted that we are called to be a, dialogue, uh, a church in dialogue because the triune God has entered into dialogue with us and has shared with us the mission of the incarnate word in the world. Dialogue is a fruit of the council. It was not foreign to the church prior to the Second Vatican Council, but it was in the conciliar period. The dialogue really entered into the vocabulary, the daily vocabulary of the church, uh, and the vocabulary in a special way of the Vatican. In August 1964, in the midst of the Second Vatican Council, uh, Pope Paul VI issued uh, an encyclical, Ecclesium Suum, in which he identified dialogue as a foundational means by which the church is to carry out its mission. It's interesting to note that that's encyclical, very much in the same spirit of John XXIII's Pacham and Terrace that came out a year earlier, uh, differs in one significant way. Pope John never uses the word dialogue, whereas Pope Paul VI uses the word some 66 times and it becomes the governing theme of the last part of that encyclical. So Ecclesium Suum argued that dialogue was very much a part of the plan of God, that God initiates and enters into conversation with the human race. Pope Paul 
Six speaks of salvation history as the long and many splendored conversation between God and humanity, and in turn invites the church to enter into dialogue with the world, with humility, with clarity, with trust. How do we enter into dialogue? How does the Second Vatican Council call us to enter into dialogue? It suggests that we're to enter in with a spirit of friendship, with respect, with service, open to all, never compromising the truth, requiring wisdom and learning and discernment, built on freedom, guided always by hope and love. For too many centuries, relations between the Catholic Church and other Christian communities and churches and relations with other religions were very polemical and apologetic in a negative sense. Uh, the Second Vatican Council calls us to enter into dialogue, living out the basic gospel virtues of respect, and recognition of the religious freedom of the other, and as we'll see in a moment, with the possibility of learning, genuine learning from the other. So Gaudium et Spes, Church in the Modern World, summons the faithful to establish dialogue with the world and with people, this is important, of all shades of opinion, and identify sincere and prudent dialogue as an intrinsic key to the rightful betterment of this world in which we all live. Following the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church, through successive popes and in, on the national levels, uh, fostered dialogue. Pope John Paul II's lengthy pontificate uh, was marked by a profound engagement with the world. He viewed dialogue, I quote, as an indispensable step along the path to human self-realization, the self-realization both of each individual and of every human community. His travels frequently involved dialogue with other faith leaders. I worked in Rome at the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity for seven years, from 2001 to 2008. So during that time, had the opportunity of serving both under Pope John Paul II and, and Pope Benedict XVI. And Pope Benedict very much continued the thrust towards dialogue. He focused in a significant way on faith and reason, both having to have their rightful place to become capable of that dialogue. He wrote, wrote that dialogue of cultures and religions so urgently needed. He called forth a dialogue which was grounded in a genuine mutual search for what is true, good, and beautiful. Now, Pope Francis uh, certainly continues this thrust towards dialogue, uh, but really stresses uh, that dialogue is not to be limited to international commissions and that international commissions can only accomplish so much. He calls for a culture of encounter, a culture which is imbued within the church, which is imbued with a desire to enter into conversation with others, including others who differ from us. Dialogue, he says, is the only way for individuals, families, and societies to grow the only way for the life of peoples to progress. Either today, either we stand together with a culture of dialogue and encounter, or we all lose, we all lose. He describes dialogue as making room for the other, for another point of view. He wrote, we're challenged to be people of depth, attentive to what is happening around us and spiritually alert. To dialogue means to believe that the other has something worthwhile to say and to entertain his or her point of view and perspective. Engaging in dialogue does not mean compromise, does not mean negotiation. It doesn't mean renouncing our ideas or our traditions, but it means recognizing that the other will have valuable things to contribute to us. We're gonna talk a little more about ecumenical learning in a little bit. In summary, of the value of dialogue, our, our text, the church in dialogue said this. Okay. Recent popes have called the church to be in dialogue with the world around us for multiple reasons. 
because God is in dialogue with the world in human history and summons us to share in this redemptive dialogue, to witness to God and Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that can be heard and understood, to build up the common good, drawing a special attention to those in need and laying foundations for peace, to benefit from the mutual enrichment which comes from genuine dialogue, and to build a culture which addresses its tensions and conflicts and the great challenge of living together through dialogue. In the Catholic Church, we have a, a robust ecclesiology, a, a self-confidence that God is very much at work in our church. And at some points in the past, that has meant that we have not opened ourselves to dialogue with others. We would argue today, rather, that that robust confidence that God is in work in us should translate into a desire to be in dialogue with others, to see what God is doing in the life of others, and to look for the mutual enrichment that dialogue brings. So the first challenge of the evening is uh, the need to express the need for creative efforts, a, a dialogue at all levels of the church's life. To dialogue is human. The ability to dialogue enhances life in, in so many ways. It is a basic human skill and a Christian way of living, resolving conflicts, dealing with differences. And dialogue is deeply enriching for participants. As Annie Dillard, perhaps my favorite writer of all time, says about the life of the mind, we can say about a life of being in dialogue, that despite some appalling frustrations, it is the happiest life on earth. Such dialogue can be fully within the parameters of church teaching. Dialogues don't need to be formally structured. They don't need to be organized in order to, in, in a systematic way, in order to enrich you or the dialogue partner. Dialogue begins with paying attention to living with people who have differences from ourselves. So how we're going to proceed for the rest of the lecture. We're going to look, first of all, at ecumenical conversations, and in particular, two initiatives. And I'll invite or raise a practical application for each. Then we'll look to interfaith dialogue, again, putting forth two initiatives and a practical application, and then look to indigenous relations, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and spiritual in, in encountering uh, indigenous spiritual traditions. At the latter part of this, we might end up accelerating the pace and skipping a little bit because the idea is to finish by about 8.30 or 8.35 to leave at least 25 minutes for a question and answer. I'm going to be drawing on some of the dialogues that I've been able to privilege to participate in on an international and national level and uh, we'll tell some stories along the way and try to make some fairly straightforward points that can help us on the path of dialogue. So, first of all, ecumenical relations. If we're talking about conversations over a fence, uh, as Robert Frost suggests, perhaps it's not really a fence that's called for between Christian brothers and sisters. If it's a fence, it's a low fence where we can easily reach across. The Second Vatican Council laid out the principles for uh, conversations, dialogue with other Christian communities. It suggested that we were all responsible for divisions and that all Catholics are called to work towards and pray for reconciliation. It talked about our divisions as really being a scandal, a scandal of disunity. And it made a shift. Uh, the shift was most deeply evident if we look at the way in which at the middle to late part of the 19th century, we had two words to describe other Christians. They were heretics, that is Protestants, or they were schismatics, that is Orthodox. With the Second Vatican Council, our vocabulary crystallized such that we recognized other Christians as brothers and sisters in Christ and other Christian communities as being in a real but incomplete communion with the Catholic Church. So, 
uh, here are some of the international uh, dialogues. Uh, they, well, this is a full listing of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity's dialogues on a, on a world level. And uh, Bishop Linda, who's here this evening, is a member of the International Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue. And as I'll share in a moment, we, for many years, had the privilege of co-chairing the National Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue. And here are some of the Canadian, Canadian Catholic uh, dialogues. But dialogues are not meant to be reserved to international or national commissions. Much creative dialogue takes place at the local level. In his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, Pope John Paul II asked why the Holy Spirit permitted so many divisions between Christ's disciples through the centuries. And he queries, could it not be that these divisions have been a path continually leading the church to discover the untold wealth contained in Christ's gospel and in the redemption accomplished by Christ. Perhaps all this wealth would not have come to light otherwise. Quite an extraordinary quote. In his encyclical Ut Unum Sint, that they all may be one, from 1995, he spoke of dialogue not only as an exchange of ideas, but as an exchange of gifts. Here he was building on the foundations of the Second Vatican Council. Perhaps the most controversial sentence of the Second Vatican Council came from Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, paragraph eight, where it said that uh, the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, but many elements of the Church are also found in other Christian communities. What exactly did it mean? The decree on ecumenism was written very much in conjunction with uh, Lumen Gentium, and it set forward principles which I would summarize as follows, that in terms of ecumenical learning, that wherever elements of the church, and it, it, it sees communion, this real but incomplete communion, as being based on the reality that what we see as Catholics as essential elements of the church, most of those elements, many of those elements are found in other Christian communities and sometimes more in a more enhanced way. So in some, wherever elements of the church have been more effectively emphasized in other Christian communities, wherever the fruits of the Holy Spirit have been received in ways which differ but are complementary to their reception in the Catholic Church, wherever a fuller appreciation of any aspect of revelation is found, one can speak of gifts which could be received by the Catholic Church gifts with the potential to lead its faithful, and I quote, to a deeper realization of the mystery of Christ and the church. So the decree on ecumenism is not minimalist about what the Catholic church can gain by entering into dialogue with other Christian communities, with other churches. In one of the most beautiful sentences in John Paul II's Udunum Sint, he notes, Ecumenical relations over the past decade, and I quote, have enabled us to discover what God is bringing about in the members of other Christian communities, Christ churches and ecclesial communities. In Evangelii Gaudium, uh, Pope Francis stresses the importance of trusting other Christian communities. If we really, I quote, if we really believe in the abundantly free working of the Holy Spirit, we can learn so much from one another. It's not just about being better informed about others, but rather about reaping what the Spirit has sown in them, which is also meant to be a gift for us. So the first movement that I want to speak about here under ecumenism is called receptive ecumenism. It's about learning from others and being on the lookout for ways to learn. Where can we learn in relations with other Christians? How and where? Can our church adapt a stance of learning, a posture of learning? And how might that enhance our own ecclesial life? The implied notion here is that there's an untold wealth to be found in other Christian churches, and, an under, and that's the underlying assumption between this, this movement called receptive ecumenism. 
Paul Murray is a, an English Roman Catholic lay theologian, and he coined the phrase, uh, and uh, his, his framework is fundamentally the framework of the Second Vatican Council. He argues that on the one hand, uh, our, our longed for, long desired, uh, full, visible communion with other Christian churches is probably a, a long way off. In the short to, to medium term, that goal is recognized as unrealistic. But he also sees that it's essential that we continue to work towards that full, visible unity. He strongly affirms that the church cannot let go of its ecumenical enterprise just because it gets tough. Sorry, I've already hit that one. So, Paul Murray takes us on, a, a, takes our pluralistic context as a given, and he suggests that the key question of our age is whether we can live difference from mutual flourishing rather than mutually assured destruction. Murray's particular focus is on learning from the differences in other Christian communities. Receptive ecumenism in the, is in the first instance an ethic. In the context of division, it invites churches to move away from competition with each other and instead to attend to and act upon uh, our responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the other. So the basic principle is that considerable further ecumenical progress is indeed possible, but only if each of the traditions, that is, each of our churches, both singly and jointly make a clear programmatic shift from prioritizing the question, what do our various others, what do other churches first need to learn from us, and instead to ask, what do we need to learn and what can we learn or receive with integrity from our others? The invitation is for each church to take responsibility for its own learning and to facilitate the learning of the other, but at their pace. It's not up to us to tell other Christian churches what we think they should be learning from us. Uh, Murray would go on to uh, say uh, in this that really the, the invitation is to work out of our weakness. Uh, we're so tempted when we enter into ecumenical dialogue to work out of our, our strengths, but he encourages us to, to work out of our weaknesses. He says today, and I think you would resonate with this, that many in the church see ecumenical work as uh, a good thing, but it's kind of an optional extra. And there's a lot of other things that we need to do, and pastors and those in church leadership feel a lot of stress, so many things we should be doing. And he said, we really need to move to a different kind of thinking where we engage in ecumenical relations so that we can be enriched, so that our life as church can be much more uh, enhanced and rich. I have a cartoon on my desk which shows a plane, and it says, yes, we are really moving, and there is no reverse. Uh, yesterday at the Vatican, Pope Francis said, Ecumenism is not optional. The search for Christian unity is essential to Christian faith. So. There's, a, there's a basic humility which is built into receptive ecumenism. Um, traditionally in ecumenical, I mean frequently I would say in ecumenical relations we do what Paul Murray says, bringing out our best tea set our best China tea set. We want to look good in front of the other, so what we bring into conversation with the other is the things that where we're feeling really strong. And he says, that's not helpful. Uh, we need an ecumenical encounter which is deeply honest and which especially brings forth the areas in the church where we're struggling and struggling deeply and looking to where the other, the dialogue partner, can enrich us. This is instead of... Uh, best China tea set ecumenism, it's what he calls an ecumenism of the wounded hands. And we need to show other those, those wounds rather than conceal them. Maria suggests that the learning that could take place with a receptive ecumenism 
model would make each Christian community more authentically itself. The Catholic Church would become more Catholic, more fully and richly Catholic, more fully and richly the Church of Christ, and more clearly the sacrament of intimate union with God and with the unity of all humankind. So here, receptive ecumenism is about the intensification, complexification, further realization of one's ecclesial identity, not its diminishment and loss. The challenge is for each tradition to become more fully itself, more fully the church by, of Jesus Christ by learning from the richness of other traditions. So to end this little section, where do we foster or where can we cultivate that attitude of learning? Where can we look for encounter with the other as an opportunity to be enriched? Where can we do that on a local level, not leaving it to dialogues that take place internationally? The second motif that I want to pick up on is uh, about walking together. Sometimes conversations uh, over the fence lead to uh, walking together. This is another Pope Francis quote on receptive ecumenism, but I'm going to zip past it here. Okay, so here we go. Sometimes uh, walking together actually invites leaping over the, the fence uh, to walk with, to accompany the other. So uh, the main part of this footnote is a quotation from uh, the ecumenical directory, a key Catholic source guiding our ecumenical engagement. Uh, and it talks about how we can make a, a better contribution when we act together, and indeed that we should act together. It's a reformulation of an old principle from the World Council of Churches from 1952 called the Lund Principle, that Christian churches should do all things together except where deep differences require that we act separately. Pope Francis, in celebrating the two, in marking the, 200, uh, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation really endorsed that Lund principle. The fact is that uh, we don't live that way. We do most things separately except where extraordinary circumstances force us to act together. How do we flip that? I want to talk about two Anglican Roman Catholic initiatives. The first on an international level, and it's a commission that I chair. It's uh, called the Commission for Unity, that I co-chair, Commission for Unity and Mission. And uh, in the fall, uh, September, October of 2016, uh, Pope Francis and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, invited pairs of bishops from 19 different parts of the world uh, to come together. And uh, we met with them first in Canterbury. We met with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Then we went to Rome. The Archbishop of Canterbury came along. And uh, there was a prayer service where we were commissioned as pairs. And we were asked by Pope and Archbishop of Canterbury, will you in word and deed proclaim the good news of peace for those who live under the threat of violence, the good news of mercy for those who live in want and with shame? the good news of justice for those who are oppressed? Will you strive to be united in preaching the gospel in word and deed, united in serving those who are vulnerable and marginalized? We were told as we were commissioned that the next day we were going to receive a, a Lampedusa cross, and I, I brought mine here this evening. So this is, so uh, we didn't know what to expect. Uh, but most, of, uh, most often when bishops told, are told they're going to be given a cross, they think uh, a, a pe pectoral cross. Uh, none of us knew exactly what a Lampedusa cross was, uh, but I should have figured it out. Uh, Lampedusa is an island off of Sicily, and it's an island where many boats have capsized, boats carrying asylum seekers from North Africa. It's a place where thousands of bodies of asylum seekers have come drifting to, to shore. It's a place where uh, many, many ships have, have capsized, have sunk, and the dreams of people have died. 
So the Lampedusa cross is made out of shipwreck uh, that landed on the coast of this island off of Sicily. Pope Francis went to Lampedusa shortly after he became Pope. There's a, an interesting story that uh, Father Tom Rosica relates uh, that I think it's probably a true story. The Italians say, si non è vero, è ben trovato. If it's not true, it could be or it should be. But the story is basically that uh, uh, Pope Francis asked very soon after becoming Pope to go to Lampedusa. And he was told by those he worked with most closely that there's a lot of places in the world that he might want to visit and he should take his time and think about it, right? And he said, good, good, but I really want to go to Lampedusa. And then the encouragement was, okay, but it takes like a, a year, 15 months to organize a papal visit. And uh, he said, I want to go now. <laughs> and uh, the response was not very forthcoming. And then the Secretary of State got a phone call uh, from Alitalia saying, I just need to let you know that Jorge Mario Bergoglio has booked himself on a flight to <laughs> Lampedusa. So he went three or four months after becoming Pope. And uh, there he proclaimed uh, in a homily, these brothers and sisters of ours were trying to escape difficult situations to find serenity and peace. They were looking for a better place for themselves and their families, but instead they found death. And Pope Francis asked, has any one of us wept because of this situation and others like it? Has any one of us wept for these persons who were on the boat, for the young mothers carrying their babies, for these men who were looking for a means of supporting their families? We are a society which has forgotten how to weep, how to experience compassion, the suffering with others. The globalization of indifference has taken away from us the ability to weep. Let us ask the Lord for the grace to weep over our indifference, to weep over the cruelty of our world and of our own hearts. And for those who by their decisions on the global level have created situations that lead to these tragedies, forgive us, Lord. So holding the Lampedusa cross, you feel a connection to, to those people and those dreams and the pain. More broadly and poignantly, it's an invitation for all Anglicans and Roman Catholics and indeed all Christians to walk together and to work together in responding to the suffering of those around us. The other Anglican Roman Catholic resource that I want to alert you to uh, is uh, a new resource uh, produced by the National Dialogue, which is going to be made public. Uh, what day is today? The 17th? In 11 days. It's going to be made public uh, on uh, January 28th. And uh, there are actually two projects of the National Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue here. And Bishop Linden and I had the privilege of, of working on both of them. Uh, but the new one, the one that's just being made public now, is, uh, is about telling stories. It's about Anglicans and Roman Catholics in different places taking steps towards unity, significant steps. And it's an encouragement for all of us to take the steps that are possible. Think of the Lund principle. To do all things together except where deep differences require that we act separately. And there aren't all that many contexts where we're required to act separately. I want to tell you what is my favorite story from this, uh, this volume. It's a story uh, that was told by Professor Margaret O'Gara, and some of you would, uh, would know Margaret or would remember her, uh, an extraordinary person. So she taught a class in Christology, and uh, it was the end of the year, and so here's, here's her telling the story. Our discussion had been deep. Students turned to somewhat more personal conversation at the end of the class. Two of them found family roots several generations back in Nova Scotia. One, a Roman Catholic man from Toronto, was entering the Augustinian monastery as a young monk. The other, an Anglican woman about the same age, was a candidate for ordination. Two Christians, a Roman Catholic and an Anglican, facing a common future in ministry, though in two different communions. As they talked, the young woman mentioned the name of her great-grandmother. The man's great-grandmother had the same name. 
the two of them began firing a series of questions at each other about names, marriages, families, children, as the rest of us looked on in surprise until at last one of them leaned across the seminar table and gave the other a kiss of peace. Then the story came out. Long ago, two sisters had grown up in an Anglican family in Nova Scotia. One had become a Roman Catholic and then married a Roman Catholic. Her Anglican family was so upset with this decision that they banished her from the family and cut off all further contact with her. This was common in Nova Scotia at the time. Exclusion if a family member left the communion or married someone from another communion. That certainly went both ways. So these two sisters parted in life for conscience's sake, never saw each other again. Gradually their families lost all contact with each other. What remained was the knowledge that a branch of the family was missing. Those two sisters were the grandmothers of my two students. Each student, raised in a fervent religious home, had been drawn by the love of Christ to seek ordination. And now at last the two branches of this divided family had found each other again through a course on Christ. That summer there were two ordinations. Each of my two students and their families attended the ordination of the other and shared in the reading from the scriptures. Each included a prayer that their ministries would be an instrument of reconciliation, not only for their families, but also for their churches, so that they could again live as sister churches. Each has made ecumenical work central to their ministry. It's an extraordinary story and a true story. And it's a parable because it speaks of the way in which we are related, but have lost sight of the depth of that relationship. What stories can you tell? What stories can we tell about walking together? How can we witness to our faith despite our differences, witness to a world that in so many ways is absolutely oblivious to the things which separate us or indifferent to them? Wow. All that we hold together compels us to be creative in seeking ways to walk together. So using the fence imagery here, I mean, perhaps the fence that separates us is, is much smaller or is a little bit of a, an artificial fence. It should be a bridge. Okay, I want to turn to interfaith relations for these next 10 minutes or so. Um, Again, after the Second Vatican Ad and after the Second Vatican Council, there's been a strong support for the Church to enter into interfaith conversations. In 1986, Saint Pope John Paul uh, spoke to a gathering in India. He wrote, he said that by dialogue we let God be present in our midst. For as we open ourselves to one another, we open ourselves to God. At the dawn of a new millennium, in an address titled Dialogue Between Cultures for a Civilization of Love and Peace, Pope John Paul II invited believers and all men and women of goodwill to ponder the theme of dialogue between cultures and traditions, saying, this dialogue is the obligatory path to building a reconciled world. In a world marked by violence and war, dialogue offers a prophetic witnesses and nourishes a lively sense of the value of life itself. So here Pope Francis uh, notes that there should be an essential bond between dialogue and proclamation in our relations with other Christians. Uh, Interreligious dialogue and evangelization do not exclude one another. Dialogue is a, a form of witness. We do not impose anything. We don't employ any subtle strategies in interfaith dialogue. We bear witness to what we believe, and we listen deeply to the other. In the Second Vatican Council's document on interfaith dialogue, it notes in the Stretate, the Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in other religious traditions. They often reflect the ray of that truth that enlightens all people. So if we think about fence imagery again in interfaith dialogue, sometimes we don't get a very good view of the other and we end up peeking through a fence hole 
or leaning over a very tall fence. If we had a little more time, I'd like to, I would have told you a story about uh, uh, my first encounter with interfaith dialogue, which was through the Jewish writer Chaim Potok. He wrote a novel called The Chosen, which I think some of you would have read. And it was about two rabbinical students during the Second World War. Uh, but it was about the struggle between maintaining faith and living deeply in the world in which we find ourselves. And uh, those novels, that novel and other novels by Potok, were really key to my own entering, entering into the seminary. So uh, being able to see living in the world as and where it is with a secular mindset and holding to faith tradition, that was, that was really critical for me. Uh, I looked for an occasion to be involved in Jewish-Christian relations, and I worked in Rome, and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity was headed by the same cardinal and secretary, Cardinal Casper, Bishop Farrell, as the commission, the Vatican's commission for relations with the Jews. But we were kind of compartmentalized in our work. I heard during my time in Rome about a movement called scriptural reasoning, which brought biblical scholars, Talmudic scholars, Quranic scholars together to share in a reading of texts on common themes and to unpack for the other uh, what those texts meant. They called it gathering in the tent of meeting. I tried to initiate something like that when I was in Saskatoon, uh, but there weren't enough Quranic scholars and Talmudic scholars to really get it going. And uh, then a different possibility opened. A new rabbi came to Saskatoon, a rabbi who was from Argentina, who knew, who knew Pope Francis, a rabbi who didn't have a network of people that he was associated with, and, and we became friends. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we started to talk about frequently was the music of Leonard Cohen. And Cohen had ours. I mean, I grew up, I was six years old when my sister Suzanne came home with a single of Suzanne. I have been puzzled all my life by how somebody deeply Jewish could have so much Christian imagery in his songs. And then I heard about the song, Who by Fire, uh, a, a song that I love very much. So, uh, and uh, I heard that the, the words of Who by Fire were actually a, a prayer. And so I asked uh, Rabbi Claudio to explain it to me, and he did. And then we thought of the idea of hosting an evening. A rabbi and a bishop walk into a concert. <laughs> I don't know how it is here, but in Saskatchewan, if you host an ecumenical or an interfaith event, you get 25 or 30 people, and they're eager to be there, and it's great. But we knew that Leonard Cohen had a lot of fans out there, so we printed 130 bulletins, and we hosted this event at the synagogue. And when I got there 20 minutes before, I had to park three blocks away. There were over 500 people, and sitting, people were sitting uh, at the back of the synagogue on the, on the back stage. And it was a, a beautiful experience. So here are the words of this uh, song, Who by Fire? Well, here's the, the prayer from Rosh Hashanah. It's not the exact words, because Cohen adapts the words. And I brought a little clip, if this is going to work, here's hoping, of uh, Rabbi Claudio explaining a little bit about this this song. So, from someone who was, who is religious, and maybe he's not an Orthodox Jew, but he defines himself as an observant or religious Jew, being there during Yom Kippur in this difficult war, uh, I can imagine that this was a very difficult experience of confronting death, which is exactly what we do during this day of Yom Kippur. We have lots of traditions for this day that invite us to think that Yom Kippur is some type of rehearsal of our own death. Because when you confront death, you can bury your life. So what I think, and this is my view of this song, is that 
his understanding, his experience in Israel with war and with death as an opportunity of evaluating his own life. And what he's doing with the song is updating or upgrading the traditional prayer. I don't think that he's modifying the theology of the prayer. Uh, maybe, and maybe in one verse I'm going to ask Tom what he, he thinks about this. Uh, the interesting thing is that he uses modern categories. Maybe things that are not included in the original prayer, like love, war, an accident. Uh, so he's writing the prayer again. Now, the most interesting thing about this prayer, if you see the, the lyrics, is that after every one of the paragraphs, after saying who by fire, who by water, who in the sunshine, etc., he asks, and who shall I say is coming? And this is a very strange verse. I don't know what he wants to say with this. Uh, what I said to Don when we were studying this is that maybe this is some type of irony or even a joke. Because what I imagine is it's like a secretary receiving the message of someone who is calling the boss. And the secretary is saying, okay, but who shall I say is calling? <laughs> The friendship that formed between Rabbi Claudio and I led to other things. He said to me one day, we've got our Holocaust survivor coming, and uh, the biggest facility that we have is a few hundred people, and we'd like to invite uh, many more. You have a new cathedral that seats 2,000. Do you think we could use your cathedral to host the Holocaust survivor? And I said, nothing could make us happier. And the Holocaust survivor came, Nate Leipziger from Toronto, and uh, Rabbi Claudio spoke. I spoke about the pain of our anti-Semitic history. And uh, it was an extraordinary event of reconciliation that over 2,000 high school students from the city were able to witness. The same thing has now happened in Regina, and we've had more Cohen evenings, even with a new rabbi in a different city. Uh, the invitation here is, first of all, to keep your eyes open to the encounters which are part of daily lives, the interfaith encounters, and to look for ways to, to celebrate those and to draw out the religious depths of them, and to look for ways in which, in which faith and culture can draw us into a dialogue. Certainly our experience was that that dialogue about faith and culture, centering around Cohen and his lyrics, captured the imagination of people more than anything else that we had tried to do in the public sphere for a very long time. And finally, to let friendship between faith traditions be a path to, to justice, um, because it certainly led us that way. The next slide is something that I'm going to skip over, but it's a, a great initiative uh, of Anglican and Roman Catholic friends of mine in Rome for a series on Islam, uh, which again was really captured people's attention. Uh, I want to take the last three or four minutes to, to talk about relations with uh, our indigenous people. I think that it's the most important conversation that we're called to in the country, in this country at this time. I heard the introduction that Jim gave about the land that we're on. Uh, in Saskatchewan, 16% of our population are uh, First Nations or Métis, so a very significant percent. And uh, there were 20 residential schools, and the legacy of residential schools is before us uh, all, the, all the time. I was on a summer walk uh, three years ago on the prairies, and I was with an anthropologist, and I said, so what is the oldest trace of uh, human settlement on what is now Saskatchewan? And he said, 10,000 years ago. I mean, there's a settlement that dates to 10,000 years ago, uh, and that didn't surprise me. Uh, and he said, it's between the towns of Aneroid and Pontex, and that 
shocked me because it was a half hour from the farm where I grew up. And yet I grew up really thinking that my great-grandparents and grandparents were the founding peoples of Saskatchewan as I knew it. What a shallow and impoverished understanding of history I grew up with and, and all of my generation and the generation before uh, grew up with. So in three minutes, I want to say that what we have found in Saskatchewan is that the Truth and Reconciliation final report I've got its picture here. And the calls to action directed to the churches have become a starting point for a dialogue, a conversation. And it's exceedingly important that we adopt them as a starting point for our conversation for a couple reasons. Firstly, they come out of the experience of suffering, an experience of suffering which we as Catholic Church, as, as Catholics in Saskatchewan, uh, religious communities and dioceses were implicated in as we uh, operated uh, residential schools where language was suppressed and spiritual traditions were, uh, indigenous spiritual traditions were pushed aside uh, and where uh, physical abuse was frequent and where sexual abuse also took place. Right? Uh, so it's important that our dialogue addresses the pain that we were a part of and in a systemic way. And secondly, it's important to take the calls to action as a starting point for conversation because they're put forward by indigenous people. It's reversing the whole colonial uh, mentality where if we are gonna do something with indigenous people, it's like we decide what we're gonna do and what we're gonna do for them. We now have uh, adopted their saying, nothing about us without us. Uh, and it's precisely because the calls to action are articulated and the address to the churches are articulated by indigenous people that we receive them as a, as a beautiful invitation to a conversation. For a while, we became discouraged because some of the calls to action are pretty difficult to achieve, and we were viewing them somewhat as a checklist. And then we had a guest speaker who, in fact, was uh, Murray Sinclair's son, Nigan Sinclair. And he said, you got to quit thinking of them as a checklist and think of them as a process. He didn't use the word dialogue, but I, I do now, to think of the calls to action addressed to us uh, as, as an invitation to engagement and to dialogue. It was great news in some sense that after a painful history with the Catholic Church, the Truth and Reconciliation Report didn't say we really want to have nothing to do with Christian churches anymore who ran residential schools, but rather they say they want to be engaged with us. The other key that I wanted to point to here is the importance, when invited, of engaging in dialogue about indigenous spiritual traditions. The calls to action ask for indigenous spiritual traditions to be respected. I've had the privilege in the past three, four years of, of going to a number of sweat ceremonies. And in fact, the last two years now, I bring in the new year by going to, invited to and attending a, a sweat. We go out and two years ago it was minus 36 and this year it was a balmy minus 31. Uh, and we drive out to a reserve, a reserve and we bring in the new year in a sweat where you go from about 55 Celsius to about 35 below <laughs> and back and forth. Uh, but a beautiful prayer experience. And I've had the privilege of taking part in feasts and pipe ceremonies. And this past year, attended a Sundance for a day. It was the Sundances above all that the churches were so critical of. And to be able to be invited to a Sundance and then to see what a profound experience of prayer it was, was transformative for me and healing according to the indigenous people who welcomed me, healing for them. So it's a bit delicate taking part in indigenous spiritual ceremonies. You have to be invited. Uh, but how do, we, how do we look for ways to build relationships with our indigenous brothers and sisters? And again, the calls to action or any other invitation from our indigenous brothers and sisters aren't a, aren't a checklist 
but they're an invitation for relationship in which we learn to walk together and to walk together in a new way. That is such a pivotal dialogue for us uh, in this country um, at this time. Time for me to conclude. Um, and I'm going to leave my conclusion aside because it's another three minutes. <laughs> and and uh, simply say that uh, we've been given uh, a rich tradition in the Catholic Church, uh, uh, a rich heritage, a word that the world needs to hear, but it's not hearing that word very well. And I think one of the ways forward is to cultivate or to develop a posture of dialogue towards others. That doesn't mean we don't stand for things. It doesn't mean we don't stand firmly sometimes and be willing to die for, some, for things. But most often, the tensions in our world and the tensions between ourselves and others are better addressed by rigorous dialogue than by any other means. So let us ask the Lord and let us strive to open ourselves to the Spirit's movement that we might ever more become a church in dialogue. Thank you for your patience and sorry for going over. <laughs>